Hello. This presentation on heat stress and how to beat it is to inform you about the health effects of working while temperatures and the heat index are above optimal, especially when the heat index is to the extreme. On April 8th of 2022, heat in the workplace, that's both indoor and outdoor, was enacted into the Federal OSHA's National Emphasis Program, commonly known as NEP. My name is Jeffrey Kahn with the Kentucky Occupational Safety and Health Division of Education and Training. I will discuss what could happen to a person's body and preventative steps to help protect employees from injuries caused by exposures to various degrees of hot temperatures. Heat stress can affect occupations such as outdoor construction, highway construction and maintenance, agriculture, etc. On outdoor work sites, the sun, humidity, and machinery are the usual heat sources. Heat stress also affects some indoor work sites, such as bakeries, kitchens, metal smelting, coal and energy production, chemical production plants, warehouses, manufacturers, welders, firefighters, and other emergency responders, etc., all year long, regardless of outdoor weather conditions. These plants use ovens or furnaces as a heat source, or it may just be an enclosed building without air conditioning as a heat source. Today, I will be talking to you all about heat in the workplace. Welcome to the Heat Stress, How to Beat It webinar. I will discuss what is heat stress, the symptoms of heat stress, the causes of heat stress, ways to prevent heat stress. I will also discuss what is the OSHA National Emphasis Program or NEP. Which industries are listed on this heat NEP? How will Kentucky OSH address these companies and occupations? Which OSHA regulations address heat stress? And I will also discuss resources that are available to you to assist you at your work site. What is heat stress? Heat stress occurs when the body is unable to remove enough heat to maintain the internal core body temperature. This can lead to heat-related injuries and illnesses in the workplace. How does the human body regulate internal core temperature? We start the process by eating food and water to provide fuel and water to maintain basic organ and muscle operation. Then we perform work and muscle movements to burn calories from the food, which generates heat internally. This is measured in watts. Water is needed for internal organ function and lubrication for movement of joints, muscles, and blood. Blood transfers oxygen, nutrients, fuel, and heat throughout the body. Heat is a form of energy, which is used within the body as needed. Excess heat, which is not needed by the body, must be removed from the body. To continue the discussion on how does the human body regulate internal core temperature, 
Excess heat is removed from the body through the lungs and the skin. Some heat is lost by breathing out, but heat is primarily removed through the skin. Heat is removed from the skin generally by just moving into the air surrounding the body or to other contact surfaces, which are at a cooler temperature than the skin. This is done through the radiation process and conduction process. The next step, blood flows to the skin at an increased rate as the heat exposure increases so that heat can be transferred to the sweat glands and sweat. As the sweat leaves the body, it removes heat. And as air blows across it and accelerates evaporation, it loses heat faster through the convection process. As the body removes heat through sweat evaporation, the water and salt that is lost during this process must be replaced in order to continue this process. Which way did it go? The first rule of heat energy is that heat travels in the direction from heat toward cold. As you can see in the photos, the hot frying pan, when it's placed on the laminate countertop, the heat from the hot pan travels toward and into the cooler countertop and thus melts the plastic. This also applies to heat energy as it enters and exits the human body. When employees are working in a hot environment worksite, several factors should be evaluated to prevent employees from becoming overheated to the point of suffering heat-related illnesses. The types of heat stress. Heat exhaustion and heat stroke are the two most serious types of heat stress. For heat exhaustion, treatment and recovery are usually manageable on the work site. Heat stroke is a medical emergency and needs professional medical attention and treatment. Here, I will point out symptoms that are unique to heat exhaustion and heat stroke, so appropriate and immediate actions can be taken for each condition. For heat exhaustion, actions should be taken to allow the employee to cool down as soon as these symptoms appear. Once an employee is in heat exhaustion and he or she remains in the same conditions, that can lead to heat stroke. Heat exhaustion versus heat stroke. On the left column, you will see heat exhaustion symptoms, high body temperature, rapid breathing and heart rate, muscle cramps, headache, dizziness or lightheadedness, heavy sweating, pale, clammy skin, nausea and vomiting, weakness and fatigue. On the right column, you will see heat stroke symptoms, that this is a medical emergency, call 911. The main symptoms to be aware of for heat stroke are confusion or agitation, hallucinations, and an altered mental state, the inability to sweat. That will lead to dry and red skin, fainting or unconsciousness, slurred speech, very high body temperature, 
which is more than 104 degrees Fahrenheit. The employee might also experience seizures. The recommended treatment for heat stress symptoms. If you suspect heat exhaustion, take these steps immediately. Move the person out of the heat and into a shady or air conditioned place. If necessary, lay the person down and elevate the legs and feet slightly. Remove any tight fitting or heavy clothing. Have the person sip chilled water, a decaffeinated sports drink containing electrolytes or other non-alcoholic beverage without caffeine. Please note that cool water should be the first choice. Electrolyte drinks are best suited for when a person has been sweating. Cool the person by spraying them or sponging them with cool water and fanning. Monitor the person carefully. Contact a healthcare provider if the signs or symptoms worsen or if the person doesn't improve after taking these first aid measures. If you suspect heat stroke, which is a life-threatening condition, call 911 or your local emergency number. If the person's condition gets worse, especially if he, if he or she is experiencing fainting, agitation, confusion, seizures, inability to drink, and a body temperature of 104 degrees Fahrenheit or higher. If you are a subcontractor at a job site, follow the protocol to notify your supervisors and or the parent company contact person quickly in the case that the person's symptoms might require professional medical care or a call to 911. There are other heat-related illnesses that might occur while working in a hot work site. These conditions set the stage for causing more serious conditions of heat exhaustion and heat stroke. These heat-related illnesses could include heat rash, which is caused by the clogging of sweat ducts, which traps perspiration beneath the skin. Heat cramps caused by drinking water with no salt while recovering from heat dehydration. Heat syncope, fainting or dizziness as a result of overheating. This is caused by inadequate blood flow to the brain due to the blood pooling in the skin. Dehydration, which is inadequate fluid replacement during working conditions. Water intoxication. This is caused by drinking too much water without electrolytes. Heat exhaustion, which is caused by excessive sweating, which leads to severe fluid and salt loss. Rhabdomyolysis is a condition in which damaged skeletal muscle breaks down rapidly. This is caused by muscle damage from working in hot conditions with increased concentration of inflammatory products. Heat stroke is caused by the core body temperature of 104 degrees Fahrenheit or greater. Any sign of mental confusion is a warning sign and warrants a medical emergency and a 911 call. How and why heat related illnesses develop? The body performs work which produces heat internally and metabolic products 
including some inflammatory mediators. This heat energy is used to maintain bodily functions, but excessive heat must be released to the surrounding environment to keep the body temperature around 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Heat is removed from the body through the lungs and the skin. Some heat is lost by breathing out, but heat is primarily removed through the skin. Heat is removed from the skin generally by just moving the heat to the air surrounding the body or by contacting surfaces which are at a cooler temperature than the skin. This is through the radiation process and the conduction process. Blood flows to the skin at an increased rate as the heat exposure ex increases. This is so that heat can be transferred to the sweat glands and sweat. As the sweat leaves the skin, it removes the heat, and as air blows across it, it accelerates evaporation. It loses heat faster through this convection process. The body can maintain heat equilibrium across a large range of conditions with adequate fluid replacement. However, when heat from workload generation, the natural environment, and other heat sources are escalated and are not balanced with adequate control methods, the body can become overwhelmed and lose control, thus increasing the core body temperature. As the body loses fluid and dries out, the concentration of inflammatory mediators and temperatures increase, eventually leading to heat stroke. Inflammatory mediators affect the hypothalamus gland, which is deep inside the brain. This gland is responsible for regulating body temperature, and when it gets overheated, it loses control and loses the ability to do its job. This gland is basically your body's autopilot system for this and for other bodily functions. Contributing factors to heat exposure. This is heat enters the body from external sources. These factors must be considered whether the worksite is indoors or outdoors. The sources of heat. Outdoor sources are typically from the sun, weather conditions, machinery, or tools used on the work, work site, such as asphalt heater tanks, etc. Indoor sources of heat could be boilers, furnaces, metal smelting furnaces, glass smelting furnaces, or simply be enclosed buildings without air conditioning. The surrounding conditions that either help remove heat or may enclose and or intensify the heat. These could include air movement from the wind or from fans, which will help remove heat from the body. Surfaces such as concrete, blacktop, roofing materials, water, etc., can absorb the heat from the sun, furnaces, or other heat sources. These surfaces can reflect the heat or otherwise transfer the heat back into the worker's body. Humidity, when combined with heat, intensifies how hot it feels to humans and decreases the body's ability to remove excessive heat. This is determined by the heat index factor. However, indoor heat index must be measured rather than by using weather-related tools for outdoor use only. We will discuss those measurement devices later.
other factors that contribute to heat exposure are the duration of time spent in the heat and the workload exertion level or intensity and duration which generates heat within the worker's body. This is called the metabolic rate. We will discuss that further later. Contributing factors to heat retention. That is how heat remains inside the body. This can include the clothing and or PPE, which is personal protective equipment worn by the employees. It can include direct contact with hot materials, tools, and or surfaces. It may include duration of time exposed, where breaks provided with shade and or cooled air, or water and drinks with salt or electrolytes provided to replace the water and salt that is lost through sweating. Please note that cool water should be the first choice. Electrolyte drinks are best suited for when a person is sweating or has been sweating. The lack of acclimatization to allow the body to adjust to hot temperatures and adapt to removing excessive heat biologically can be a factor. There can also be individual risk modifiers which can contribute to heat retention. These individual risk modifiers could include several things, such as disease, which could include obesity, diabetes, hypertension or high blood pressure, heart disease, or some medical conditions such as lupus, multiple sclerosis, etc., can affect or reduce how heat is processed or removed from the body. Another risk modifier could be genetic conditions. An example of a genetic condition would be a rare condition called hereditary hydrohydrotic ectodermal dysplasia. This causes underdeveloped skin and significantly fewer sweat glands as the body is developing. This greatly reduces the ability to sweat so the person cannot remove excessive heat from their bodies. Another individual risk modifier could be drugs. These can include serotonin syndrome and may involve interactions with other drugs. This could also include drugs that block sweating. It could include amphetamines. It could include alcohol. Some medications and some street drugs can affect or reduce how heat is processed and removed from the body. Another individual risk modifier could be acclimatization. This is the process of building up your metabolism or your tolerance levels to being in and working in a hot environment. This is needed when a new employee starts a new hot job or after a long weekend or vacation away from the hot environment. It could also be needed when weather conditions change suddenly from cooler temperatures to hot human conditions. Another individual risk modifier could be workability and training. Some employees may have physical limitations from injuries or disabilities that reduce their workability and increase the energy needed and the amount of heat produced internally to perform the same task as an otherwise healthy worker. Training employees on proper rest breaks, drinking water, and salt replacement recognizing heat-related illness symptoms will help reduce the incidence of these illnesses. Methods of measuring the heat index and risk factors. The heat index is typically measured by an instrument called 
a WBGT heat index meter. This stands for a wet bulb, globe, and temperature meter. When you have a work environment that is indoors, it is best to use this type of instrument for measuring the heat index. This top box shows two different models of WBGT meters. I put two pictures just to show you that there are different manufacturers and they don't all look alike. The red meter on the left shows that there are three sensors inside which is how all of the WBGT meters work. One of these sensors is a dry bulb thermometer, which is just a typical thermometer like everyone is already familiar with. The second sensor is a wet bulb thermometer. This is simply a regular thermometer with a small piece of cloth, which may be similar to a shoelace, wrapped around the mercury bulb at the bottom of the thermometer, and it is dipped in water. The third sensor is a globe thermometer. This is a thermometer which has a matte black ball wrapped around it. The black ball absorbs all different colors of light and heat energy. These three sensors are used in combination to calculate the heat index value. In the lower box, this is a heat index application or app, which is used to tell you what the outdoor heat index value is. This is an app which can be installed on your smartphone. It can be used on an iPhone or an Android type cell phone. This app was produced by NIOSH and OSHA. Many of you may have multiple work sites, or you may be a company that moves from one site to another, and this heat index app can tell you what the conditions are at that location you're in at that moment. It will summarize the conditions to be expected throughout the day at that location and break it down into hourly increments. This is a very handy tool to use. Again, it's for use in outdoor work environments. This slide shows the ACGIH heat stress TLV. ACGIH stands for the American Conference for Governmental Industrial Hygienists. TLV stands for Threshold Limit Value. This is a professional organization who make recommended threshold limit values for chemical exposures or other biological hazards in the workplace or other physical hazards such as heat stress. This graph shows simply a box with the numbers that are on the left vertical column are the heat index values measured in Celsius. And that is used as a reference point. In this table, it ranges from 20 degrees Celsius to approximately 36 degrees Celsius. In the lower horizontal scale, this shows the metabolic rate of how much work a worker might be conducting to do his job. We will discuss further in another slide what these values are, but basically they are in different degrees of doing sedentary type work ranging up toward very heavy manual labor. These are measured in watts. Now that, that's what the scales are. The TLV action limits are represented on the curved lines. The top solid line 
is the TLV, the upper limit that an employee who is acclimatized to working in a hot environment should be the upper limit that they should be allowed to be exposed to. The dotted line, the lower line, is the action limit that an employee who is not acclimatized to working in a hot environment. You see that these are curved lines because there are multiple factors involved in what and how an employee can be exposed to or work in a hot environment. There are a lot of variables involved in that, so there's not just one set number that would apply to all employees in all conditions. So this makes allowances for all these variable factors that we will discuss in these further slides later. We may refer back to this graph when I discuss an example situation of what an employee might be exposed to. This graph is what many people may have seen before, and this just applies to general exposure for anyone who may or may not be a workplace situation, but just general guidelines for any person who might be exposed to the heat. This heat index chart is put out by the National Weather Service. It is generally for outdoor conditions. It uses both the temperature and humidity to calculate how hot it feels, how the body might react to each heat index level. It uses a rating scale to help evaluate the risk levels for these different values. These range from minimal risk, caution, warning, and danger as the heat index increases. The heat index is not the only part of the equation in estimating and evaluating your worker's risk for developing heat-related illnesses. This graph shows the metabolic rate or the workload and exertion that an employee might be going through in the course of his workday. It is broken down into the main categories of how much work they're doing. On the left side of the graph, you see the categories, which would range from rest, light work, moderate work, heavy work, to very heavy work. On the right side, Examples of rest might be sitting. An example of light work might be sitting, standing, light arm and hand work, and occasional walking. For moderate degree of work would include normal walking and moderate lifting. For heavy workloads, this might include heavy material handling, walking at a fast pace. For very heavy degree of work would be work such as, as these are just examples, using a pick and a shovel. For these different degrees of work, it, it shows examples that will be used in the calculations that we will discuss further later as measured in watts. For rest, the number of watts used might be 115. For light work, the number of watts would be 180. For moderate degrees of work, the number of watts for calculations would be 300. For heavy degree of work, the watts for measurement would be 415 watts. For very heavy work, the watts would be measured as 520 watts for example of doing the calculations that we will discuss in a moment. Another factor to be evaluated in determining how much a worker can be exposed to in the heat, this will greatly affect the exposure level that an employee might experience and the risk that might be involved in being overexposed to heat. In doing the calculations for 
determining an employee's exposure. The clothing effects, and this will be called referred to as the clothing adjustment factor, and they are given values in numbers as to what type of clothing that the employee might be wearing. As you may already be aware, that the clothing that an employee would be wearing will alter the amount of convective and evaporative heat exchange so that it, it can alter the amount of heat that can be released from the body into the surrounding environment. For the purpose of these calculations, the insulating effects estimated using the clothing adjustment factors are as follows for various types of clothing. For typical everyday work clothes, such as long sleeve shirt and pants, this is typical, so it's given a value of zero for the purposes of these calculations. Cloth coveralls is also given a value of zero for these calculations. Anytime that an employee might be wearing two layers of clothing, then the value of three is used for these calculations. For SMS polypropylene coveralls, this is given a value of 0 0.5. For employees who might wear polyolefin coveralls, which are typically known as Tyvek, this is given a value of one. For limited use vapor barrier coveralls, which could include occupations such as firefighters with their bunker gear that they wear on the work site, or what you, some people might call moon suits uh, for operations such as emergency response to uh, hazardous waste chemical spills and such like that, that are totally enclosed and have their own supplied air oxygen within that. And firefighters also have their own air supplied oxygen underneath their work clothes when going into a burning building. That is given a value of 11. We will discuss these clothing factors later in our discussion about the calculations. For coveralls, this is assuming that that is what they're wearing with only basically socks and underwear underneath and not wearing multiple layers of clothes. If you're wearing multiple layers of clothing, then that would fit into the double layer woven clothing category and given a value of three. Now we will discuss some of the formulas and calculations that can be involved in evaluating an employee's potential stress level and exposed to heat. Okay, I'm an industrial hygienist, so my whole world depends on math, chemistry, and biology. For those of you who don't like math, fasten your seatbelts we're going to go over some of these calculations to apply these heat index values in these previous tables that I've just shown you, along with other conditions at your work site to see what level your employees may be at risk. The first calculations that are listed here give you what is known as the effective wet bulb globe thermometer rating, the WBGT rating. To get this, you take the reading that you might get from the meter that we showed you earlier, just simply the value that it shows as a heat index value, or the heat index value that you might get from the phone app that is just giving you a value of what the heat index rating is at that moment. You would take that reading that you get from the meter that we showed you earlier, the WBGT reading, and then you would add the clothing adjustment factor, whether that be typical work clothes or special coveralls or two layers of clothing and such like that. You would take these clothing adjustment values 
and add that to whatever the number is that you get from the readings for the heat index value to show you what the environmental conditions are for the heat index value. So it must be added to the clothing that the employee is wearing. This gives you the effective WBGT reading. The next step would be to take this WBGT effective reading and compare it to the metabolic rate of what type of work the employee is doing. And you would compare that to that table that we discussed from the American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists. And the balance of that, where these two levels meet on that graph, will give you your exposure level, and that will be compared to the threshold limit value. Here is the ACGIH heat stress TLV values. In an example that I'm using, if the environmental WBGT meter is showing a value of the heat index of 28.8 degrees Celsius, and let's say the employee is wearing a Tyvek suit, then from the table that we took earlier, that's given a value of one. So you take the one and add it to the value of 28.8 Celsius, then that equals an effective value of 29.8 WBGT heat index value. Then you take the 29.9, if you look at the 30 on the left vertical scale, but let's say that the employee is doing a moderate amount of work on their job, which from the table that we discussed earlier, a moderate amount of work measured in the, as the metabolic rate measured in watts, in that example is 300. So if you take the 29.8 heat index value and see where the, the value of the metabolic rate of 300 cross is up there just above the acronym TLV. So you see that that employee would be above the threshold limit value according to the scale. Okay, so that is just to show you that it can be very complicated to measure and evaluate all these different variable factors. So federal OSHA has made all of that easier by creating what they call a heat stress calculator. This is not an app to be easily downloaded onto your phone, but you can enter this web address site onto your phone and pull that site up and mark it as a bookmark or a favorite so that you can easily pull it back up and take it with you to your job site. This calculator simplifies things much, makes it much easier than going through all these involved calculations that I just finished. It has simple input boxes that I will list here below. You will first enter the WGBT heat index value, which you would get either from the meter or from the app that you've installed on your phone to give you the outdoor environment heat index value. You can enter that value in Fahrenheit, which is what most people in this country are familiar with. That way you don't have to worry about converting from Fahrenheit to the metric system. The next thing you would enter would be the workload. And this is put in simple scales of, is it a work level of rest, light work, moderate work, heavy work, or very heavy? So it's, it's broken down into simple categories. You don't have to worry about the numbers. The next thing you would work, enter would be, is the employee acclimatized for working in the heat? That's simply, yes, they are acclimatized or no, they are not. 
The next entry is the clothing adjustment factor. This is put into simple values. The next entry would be putting their body weight status. And this is simply put into the categories of, are they of normal weight or are they overweight? And then hit the button, submit. It will calculate internally to tell the employer if the worker under those conditions is potentially over the TLB value. Here we have listed several actions that can be taken as prevention methods. We have just broken it down into bullet points. I will elaborate on these some, but not necessarily in the same order that they're listed here. One action is the water and salt replacement. As I explained earlier, water is essential for internal body functions and movement. Water and salt are removed from the body through sweating, and this removes heat from the body. The water and salt that is lost from the sweating process must be replaced consistently to keep the process of heat removal working properly. Don't wait to feel thirsty before drinking water because prevention of heat-related illness is much easier than recovery. Taking rest breaks, whether your work environment is indoor or outdoor, take rest breaks away from the heat source. If you're working outdoors, Rest in a shaded area, if possible, and in an air-conditioned area, if possible. Use fans and or air movement to help cool the body. If you're working in an outdoor environment, keep in mind that resting in a car or a truck without air conditioning may not be effective because it could be even hotter inside the vehicle even if this vehicle is in the shade, it could still be very hot inside that car. If you're working indoors, take rest breaks away from the heat source or the furnace or the kitchen or whatever might be the heat source. If possible, take your rest breaks in an air-conditioned area. This allows your body to cool down and recover somewhat before you go back to work in the hot environment. Acclimatization. This is a process of building up your metabolism and tolerance levels for being in and working in a hot environment. This is needed when a new employee starts a new hot job or after a long weekend or vacation away from the hot environment or if weather conditions might suddenly change from a cold environment to a hot environment. Depending on the employee, a climatization process might take between five to seven days to adjust to the heat. To work through the process of acclimatization, the employee might work a less than a full day's job at first and then kind of build up the amount of time that they spend in the work, hot environment to help build up that tolerance level. Another factor can be training your employees and your supervisors. Training employees on taking proper rest breaks, drinking water, and salt replacements as needed, and recognizing heat-related illness symptoms in themselves and others to help reduce these illnesses. Again, please note that cool water should be the first choice in water replacement. And the electrolyte drinks should be used when a person is sweating or has been sweating. It is also a good idea to use the buddy system to have employees keep an eye on each other to recognize the symptoms and offer assistance to cool them down when the person is becoming overheated. This works best in conjunction with the training to know how to recognize 
the symptoms of being overheated. You can use engineering controls to remove heat when feasible. These are usually more used in indoor work sites. This can include things such as providing exhaust fans to the building itself or providing fans to blow on the employees to help cool them. You may also use administrative controls. These are things like adjusting work shift times and rotating work shifts. When possible, conduct work during the cooler part of the day or rotate work shift times and or workstation locations to reduce the amount of time exposed to the heat source. You may want to have a plan in place for heat-related emergencies or for just planning for how to deal with employees' exposure to heat in the workplace. It is a good idea for the employer and or supervisors to observe the temperature, the heat index, and the workload of the employees, as these may need to be adjusted each day and or during a day because heat index values can change from day to day or during the course of a day, and to recognize symptoms of heat stress illnesses with the employees. Okay, back to the big question of what is the OSHA National Emphasis Program, which is abbreviated as NEP. All NEPs ensure that employees in high hazard industries are protected from whatever the specified hazard, which has been found to have caused a high rate of injuries and deaths, or has been evaluated to, with new information from research to show that there are an increased risk from exposure to that chemical or physical hazard or biological hazard, whatever the case may be. This is for any national emphasis program. The federal HEAT NEP will focus on vulnerable workers who could be subjected to heat-related hazards, both in indoor and outdoor work environments. The federal OSHA HEAT NEP is designed to reduce or eliminate worker exposure to heat hazards. It will also target industries and work sites where employees are not provided with cool water, rest, cool shaded areas, training, and acclimatization. This is designed to be a proactive versus a reactive approach. With the National OSHA Heat NEP, there are options of using the use of enforcement, outreach to employers, and compliance assistance. Which industries will be targeted in the National Heat NEP? Here's a table of the types of industries that the federal OSHA in this program would target. This includes the NAICS codes, which is the N-A-I-C-S code. This will include industries such as bakeries and tortilla manufacturing, sawmills and wood preservation, petroleum and coal product manufacturing, basic chemical man manufacturing, glass and glass product manufacturing, iron and steel mills, and iron alloy manufacturing, non-ferrous metals, such as aluminum production and processing, foundries. It will also target construction industries such as residential building construction, non-residential building construction, utility system construction, land subdivision, highway, street, and bridge construction, other heavy and civil engineering construction. It will also include industries that may be of known exposure to high heat, such as vegetable 
and melon farming, postal service, employment services, investigation and security, restaurant and other eating establishments, such as in their kitchens. Kentucky is a state plan state where OSHA is operated under state government. In Kentucky, it's called Kentucky OSH. How will Kentucky OSH address this? The Division of OSH Education and Training, which is also known as KY Safe, will be conducting an enhanced heat illness and outreach campaign. Kentucky Safe is also addressing heat-related issues on all consultation and training activities. What are the regulations and guidelines that address heat in the workplace? There are no OSHA standards which specifically address the potential hazards of heat-related illnesses. However, Kentucky OSH has adopted its own version of the Federal OSHA General Duty Clause. In Kentucky, this is the KRS, which is Kentucky Regulatory Statutes, Chapter 338.031. It requires that employers shall furnish employees with a workplace which is free from recognized hazards that could cause serious physical harm to the employees. When there are not existing OSHA standards for hazards such as heat stress, recommendations and guidelines, which are recognized by professional organizations, might be used in conjunction with the KRS Chapter 338.031 to be cited by Kentucky OSH. The following OSHA and or Kentucky OSH regulations might also be used since these issues could be associated with heat-related injuries in the workplace. These would include record keeping. This might also include personal protective equipment because that could be a factor in heat retention of employees in the work site. Sanitation might also be a factor. It might also include medical services and first aid. It might also look at the safety and health program, professional guidelines that might be used in conjunction with these general duty regulations that might be cited by Kentucky OSH, could include the ACGIH. TLVs and BEIs under their thermal stress or heat stress program. NIOSH, which is the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, has also published heat stress publications and recommendations. The CDC has also published warning signs and symptoms of heat related illnesses. There are other resources that an employer might use to help them deal with heat-related illnesses and exposure in their work site. OSHA has put out the Heat Stress Guide. Another resource is the Heat Safety Tool, which is provided by OSHA and NIOSH. This is the cell phone app that we discussed earlier to apply the heat index values on your cell phone. As we had discussed earlier, there is also the OSHA heat calculator. This is to make calculating the employee's heat index exposure value in simple terms. This will make it much simpler to evaluate the potential exposure of your employees to heat stress in the workplace. The ACGIH, TLVs, and BEIs are the American Conference of Governmental 
industrial hygienists, threshold limit values, and biological exposure indices. These guidelines are something that an employer would, would need to purchase to help support the research that goes into producing these documents. NIOSH has also published a heat stress guide, another resource which might be of use, particularly in the construction industry, is put out by the Center for Construction Research and Training. This concludes this webinar. Thank you for attending the Heat Stress How to Beat It webinar.